So this morning, um, we come to the final verses of the doctrinal portion of Paul's letter to the Colossians. Now, if you remember all the way back when we started studying this wonderful book, I said that the, the book is, or the letter is organized in two parts. In part one, which we find in chapters one and two, uh, Paul's emphasis is doctrinal in nature. And what he is doing is proclaiming the all-surpassing supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in salvation. And then in chapters 3 and 4, Paul is going to turn to the practical implications of those two twin towers of truth. Now, as Paul concludes his proclamation of Christ's sufficiency, he's going to illustrate for us today the empty promise of spiritual counterfeits, the empty promise of spiritual counterfeits. And as God's providence often does, we were talking about this in Douglas's adult fellowship this morning. So uh, it's always interesting to see how the Lord organizes things unbeknownst to me. So if you would please open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter two, Colossians chapter two, and follow along as I read verses 16 through 23. I hope by now that these pages are somewhat dog-eared in your Bible and you can find them easily. So Colossians 2 verses 16 to 23. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, no one is to judge you in food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance, or perhaps your Bible say the reality, belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you or disqualifying you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, going into detail about visions he has seen, being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from which the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? Do not handle, nor taste, nor touch all which deal with everything destined to perish with use, which are in accordance with the commands and teachings of men, which are matters having to be sure a word of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly desires or sinful desires. Now, Last week, we swam through the deep theological waters of Christ's sufficiency in verses 9 to 15. And by comparison this week, we're going to be in the kiddie pool, though what Paul has to say here is no less important. Now, I want to start by drawing your attention back to verse 8, because Paul sets up what he's going to detail here in these these verses and back in verse 8, where he expressed his central concern for the Colossian believers. And what he said was that they were not to be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception according to tradition of men and the elemental elementary principles of the world and not, by contrast, according to Christ. Now as we come to verses 16 to 23, Paul's going to expand upon these summary points which he made in verse 8. And he's going to do that by illustrating different categories of spiritual counterfeits, and then he's going to conclude with his assessment of those counterfeits. So today's sermon has two parts. The first part, we're going to see four examples of spiritual counterfeits that take your eyes off Christ. Four examples of different spiritual counterfeits, things other than Christ, that take our eyes off Christ. The first one is going to be legalism. We see this in verse 16. 
The second is going to be ritualism, which we also see in verse 16. The third is going to be asceticism, which we see in verse 18. And then the fourth is going to be mysticism, which we see in verse 18. So our first point is going to look at these four different types or uh, uh, forms of spiritual counterfeits that draw our eyes off the exclusivity and sufficiency of Christ. Now our second point, found in verses 20 to 23, is going to be Paul's assessment of these spiritual counterfeits. And he's going to assess it and preview with two words, and he's going to say they are of no value. But let's see how Paul builds these together. These closing verses function as Paul's final appeal now in this doctrinal section for Christ's preeminence by pointing out the folly or the foolishness of anything other than Christ alone. So let's examine the spiritual counterfeits that Paul identifies. And as we look into them, I just want to first draw your attention to the structure of these verses in 16 to 19. Paul is going to first uh, present the four counterfeits in two groups. So he's going to present two and two. And each group is going to conclude with a reason for their inadequacy. And then second, each group is going to be introduced with a warning. So Paul is expanding in these verses 16 to 19 and even 20 to 23 on this summary concern that he expressed back in verse 8 of chapter 2. So um, let's look first at legalism and ritualism, his first group of spiritual counterfeits, which are found in verses 16 and 17. And uh, follow along as I read these two verses again. Paul says, therefore, so with that statement, he's looking back. So therefore, based upon all the sufficiency I told you about Christ last week, no one is to judge you in food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. All things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance or the reality belongs to Christ. Now, With Paul's opening warning, he brings out two things. The first thing that he brings out for us is that he identifies one of the methods that false teachers use to take people captive. And that is by assuming the role of judge over your spiritual practices. Or in this case, to counterfeit spiritual practices focused on dietary laws and worship choices. Secondly, and more importantly, the warning suggests that there's only one rightful judge. So let me just develop that for you for a second. I don't want to rush past the importance of these because this warning gives us some key implications and assurances for the Christian. First and foremost, as a Christian, we have freedom in Christ. No one is to be our judge. We have a certain freedom in Christ. And this is really so contrary to what the world thinks, and sadly, even what many Christians think, who view submission to Christ as a killjoy, when it's really just the opposite. There's a great old preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon, some of you may know that name, and on this topic Charles Spurgeon said this, There's nothing in the law of God, and by that he's referencing the Bible in general, there's nothing in the law of God that will rob you of your joy. It only denies what would cause you sorrow. And that's really how we should look at God's principles and his commands for us. They're not there to rob us of any joy, but they're there to protect us from what would cause us sorrow. Now, The most important freedom that God provides is what? It is the freedom from the bondage of sin. Freedom from the bondage of sin. Though Paul does tell us in Romans that there are some limitations to our liberties, and those freedoms should never cause somebody to stumble, or we should never excessively use those liberties to test God's grace. 
So we do have some practical and good boundaries, which leads me to the second implication, and that is, because they're boundaries, there must be a source of those boundaries who has both the authority to establish them and the power to enforce them. And that, of course, is God, who is the moral lawgiver. He's the ruler, and he is the judge of the world. He is the only one who can rightfully judge anybody in the world. Now, put your finger uh, in, uh, in Colossians here and turn forward to James. James's letter, right after Hebrews, Hebrews, James, chapter 4. And follow along with me as I read verses 11 and 12, because I think they really help us understand this idea in terms of who alone is this rightful lawgiver and rightful judge. What Paul says, I'm sorry, what James says, beginning in verse 11 of chapter 4, is, Do not slander one another, brothers. He who slanders a brother or judges his brother slanders the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge of it. He's simply saying that you're placing yourself in an unwarranted position of power over the law, which was given by somebody far more powerful than us. And then he goes on here in verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge. And the one, and that should be capitalized in your Bibles, referring to God, who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbors? Now, this is really a perfect passage because it labels anyone who judges you for a counterfeit or any spiritual practice as a slanderer. So someone who tries to assert themselves as a judge over you, over some practice that they think is more important than Christ alone, they are slandering you by doing that. So first they slander you, but more importantly, they're slandering the one who rightly gives the law, who rightly rules and rightly judges. In other words, they're slandering God. And this, of course, is no small thing. So turn back to Colossians, if you would. And moving on, uh, Paul will now identify the first of these two isms, as I call them, which are legalism in the form of limiting food and drink, and ritualism in the form of dictating how you worship. Now, these two counterfeits represent Old Testament Jewish religious practices. So the Jewish individuals were probably the source of this teaching. Um, but they, um, uh, they're coming from Old Testament uh, Jewish reg uh, religious practices, which these false teachers were imposing on the Colossian believers as a requirement of their salvation. Now, legalism is not as obvious today as it was when Paul wrote at that time, but it is alive and well in the church. So, for example, let's take the Bible reading plan that I introduced and encouraged everybody to follow at the beginning of this year. If I were to attach some merit system to that, elevating those who faithfully uh, uh, followed it, and degrading those who did not, then I've become legalistic. I've elevated something other than God above and other than Christ above his sufficiency. The best way I think to understand and identify legalism today is this. Something becomes legalistic when an otherwise good spiritual practice like a Bible reading plan or a ministry program is weaponized and creates division. And if it is added to Christ or replaces Christ as a requirement of salvation. So these things are sneaky. They, they slip in. And, and a lot of them look like really good things. But when they become requirements above and beyond or in place of Christ's sufficiency, they become legalistic practices, which Paul is going to tell us later, are of no value. Now, ritualism is similar, 
It's just kind of extending this idea into the realm of worshiping. And it generally arises from a misplaced emphasis on worshiping in some specific way or on one specific day or other things like a slavish devotion to a particular order of service and the elements of the Sunday service that override the primary goals of fellowship and humble worship and sitting under the Lord and glorifying him in our worship. Or perhaps it would, might be an emphasis on a certain church structure or a style of music that declares all other forms as unbiblical, such as no drums or even no instruments. All of these are examples of rituals that are being raised up above that. Or even worse, maybe something like the doctrines of the Catholic Church, which says that one must be a Catholic and in the Catholic Church if you expect to be saved. Maybe one of the greatest heresies in the world today, and that's not to pick on Catholics. I'm sure there are Catholics that are genuine believers. Because remember, in the end, God saves. None of these systems, none of these churches, none of these denominations, but Christ and Christ alone. So, there are more examples, but what both legalism and ritualism have in common is that they are divisive. They show partiality and they create disunity, which is really so different than the last part of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, when he prays for all believers to be one, to be unified, to have a oneness that is united as he and the Father are in order to reflect God's glory. The church should not look like the world. We should look different from the world. When we try to act like the world, they should laugh at us because we do a lousy job of it, number one. And number two, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be looking different. There should be something about us, a glory that is reflected in the fellowship and the one another's of the church that should be so compelling and so attractive that people want to come and see what it is that the church has that is different. So again, these two first two counterfeits have this common thread of being divisive and trying to create something other than Christ in the church. Well, having warned them now about being misled by these two counterfeits, legalism and ritualism, Paul now closes this first group of counterfeits in verse 17 with the reason for their inadequacy and he presents the reason by way of a contrast. He says essentially that even good practices ordained by God in the Old Testament. God did ordain dietary laws. He did ordain ceremonial worship laws. Were only meant to be a shadow. Okay, what's, what's a shadow? When you look at a shadow, it's kind of a, a fuzzy, not fully formed and distinct and clear picture of something. You kind of have an essence of what's there, but you can't really make it out in its entirety. What Paul says is these things were just the shadow of the realities that we now have in Christ. Now, it's not to say that these practices and regulations themselves were bad, but rather that their purpose was to point to a future and present reality that we now have in Christ. Christ is the substance. He is the reality. He's not the shadow. He is the real thing and he is sufficient. So he is the reality that these Old Testament practices pointed to. Now, the writer of Hebrews captures this. So again, put your finger in Colossians and, and just page over to Hebrews chapter 10. So right before James, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. And the writer of Hebrews comments on this idea of something being a shadow in the context of the law when he says this, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. He says, For the law, since it has only a shadow, there it is, our word, it's only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things to come, can never 
by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Now he's going to go on to develop Christ, the reality and the better sacrifice, but just note what he says. Those things were a shadow. They were a forerunner. They were intended to point us to the reality, which is Christ. Now, just turn back to the first chapter of Hebrews, and, and notice how the writer establishes this reality of Christ at the very outset of the letter. So Hebrews chapter 1, he starts this way. He says, God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Okay, so what did he do? These were shadows. They were real people, but they presented things. And he goes on, in, those la in these last days, meaning now, spoke to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, and now he describes this Son, who is the radiance of his glory. He reflects God's glory and the exact representation, the substance, the reality, the exact representation of his, meaning God's nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power, who having accomplished cleansing for sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Christ, in his first coming, in his earthly incarnation, in his human form, was intended to be the exact representation of the nature and character of God, who is spirit, and we can't see. All right, back to, um, back to Colossians 2, if you would, please. So in short, with the first coming of Christ, this new era of substantial fulfillment has dawned and with this new era Christ's sufficiency alone rules supreme. To insist upon and follow um, anything else is pure folly as Christ has triumphed over them, which is just how Paul concluded in verse 15. He's triumphed over them by nailing these things to the cross. And so, we don't look at those. The bottom line is this. The way we defeat counterfeits is by knowing and being known by the original, who is Christ. Jesus says it this way in John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, ever. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay, with this now, let's look at our second group of counterfeits in verses 18 and 19. Follow along again as I read these. Let no one keep defrauding. Your Bibles probably say keep disqualifying you, or let no one disqualify you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, going into detail about visions he has seen, being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So, just as he did in verses 16 and 17 with the first group, Paul begins with a warning, and this warning represents a second method that false teachers attempt to use to deceive us with things other than Christ, and that is by disqualifying you, or maybe defrauding you, or maybe even stronger, by condemning you. So again, this warning roughly parallels what he said in verse 16, and it brings to us this next group of spiritual counterfeits. So while it parallels, I also think he's intensifying the warning as well. Now these next two things are asceticism and mysticism. Now, asceticism is a big word. What it simply means was the practice of severe treatment or deprivation of the body that was thought to effectively suppress physical urges or lusts. So depriving yourself, trying to set yourself somewhere where you wouldn't be see anything or be distracted by anything or 
severely limiting what you eat or what you drink, all in an attempt to try to control the flesh or the lusts of our body. Now, certain religious sects, even today, like monks, then and now, practice this counterfeit, believing it makes them more acceptable to God. This is a classic works-based salvation heresy, and Paul clearly rejects it in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, when he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. So asceticism was a second thing, saying you had to do certain things to deprive yourself in certain ways to make yourself acceptable to Christ and salvation. And then last, Paul addresses mysticism. He seems to spend a great deal more time on this final one than the other ones combined. Now this counterfeit most likely found its source in Greek philosophy from the time, which placed great value and emphasis on higher knowledge and mystical experiences. Higher knowledge and mystical experiences. And while the practice of worshiping angels itself is a problem, Paul's focus really is more on the product of that worship, which is extreme arrogance or pridefulness or unwarranted arrogance and pridefulness than he does on the actual target, the angels themselves. Now, we've all seen this. Okay? Someone who professes to have had a vision or a dream or I received a word from God, or I've had a religious experience, and then talks about it endlessly, insinuating in their incessant words that they are somehow more spiritually mature or on a higher spiritual plane than other Christians. Now, I'm not going to get into an argument about visions and dreams and things like that. Can God use them? He can do anything. He's God. But I think the thing that's important here is to understand kind of what separates a reality in these things from a counterfeit. Um, and, 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 the, and the point of that is to um, look at who is being glorified. Who is being glorified. Now, look, expressive worship, is there anything wrong with expressive worship? No. I mean, read the Psalms. David worshipped expressively. Look at when the Ark of the Covenant was coming back, and his former wife just trashed him because he was dancing around like a wild man, okay, as he was rejoicing in the return of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? So the line of demarcation here that Paul is condemning and what he confirms is this idea of who's being glorified. Are you glorifying yourself in these experiences, or are you genuinely glorifying God? And Paul highlights the test for this in verses 18 and 19 by contrasting the character of counterfeit worship with that of true worship. The counterfeit worship, he says, is marked by self-exaltation, whereas on the other hand, genuine worship exalts Christ, who is the source and means of our spiritual growth, which Paul notes at the end of verse 19 as the growth that is from God. Now, I like the humor in Paul's condemnation of the exalting worship. He says these people are delusional. He says they talk about the experience nonstop, and now the delusional part, they're puffed up without cause in their own minds. They're self-deceived. They're self-deceived. They've been taken captive by this desire for these experiences and are then self-deceived. On the other hand, Paul pictures true worship in verse 19 as humble and marking its object, the one who uh, binds all things together and produces pure spiritual growth. So there really probably is no better example of this than we can find in Luke's Gospel. So turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 18 and verses 9 to 14. And we can just see a vivid example of this kind of practice. 
familiar story, I think, to all of you when we get there. Luke, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. And it goes and says, Luke says, And he, okay, probably Jesus here referring to him, And he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying these things to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, right? Is that puffed up or what? Absolutely. I fast twice a week. Legalism. I pay tithes of all I get. Legalism. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And now the payoff in verse 14. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, this man, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Perfect example, is it not? Looks good, prays good, talks good. It's all about him, not about God. The humble man recognizes his depravity, recognizes his need, comes before the Lord in worship and prayerful approach that we see by this tax collector. Okay, so turn back to Colossians if you want, please, and want to note one more thing about this before we move on. So back to Colossians chapter 2. And uh, note one more thing about these contrasting forms of worship, and that is that worship that exalts self isolates you. It isolates you. And this is completely antithetical or the opposite to how God intends for believers to grow, which is through mutual dependence. And this is precisely the point of the metaphorical picture he gives us in verse 19 of the head, the body, the joints, and the ligaments, all working together to accomplish the growth, the spiritual growth, that is, from God. The Christian life, brothers and sisters, is not meant to be lived in isolation. It truly is a team sport designed by God to be nurtured through the collective body, and we're seeing that here today as the church, which Christ ha- which, of which Christ is the head. So we see this picture. When you isolate yourself, you make yourself vulnerable to our adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour somebody, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5. Well, this brings us to our second point, and that is Paul's assessment of these spiritual counterfeits, which we find in verses 20 to 23. So follow along again with me as I read these verses. Verse 20, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why? It's almost like he wants to say it twice. Why? As if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? Do not handle, nor taste, nor touch, which deal with everything destined to perish with use. Now look at this and how it ties in interestingly to verse 8, which are in accordance to the commands and teachings of men. Okay, one of the things not to be taken captive by in verse 8, which are matters having to be sure a word of wisdom, in other words, they look good in self-made religion, so it's what he repeats, he's, re- he's repeating ritualism and legalism, self-abasement, that's asceticism, and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against sinful indulgences sinful desires, or fleshly indulgence, whatever your Bible says. So like many concluding sections in Paul's letters, these verses do a double duty. They first close out his discussion, his final appeal for Christ's preeminence in chapter 2, and they're going to pave the way for 
the alternative implications that he's going to begin talking about in chapter 3. Now, Paul's assessment, as I began a while ago, was simple. He just uses two words. He says, no value. No value. They're of no value. No value against what? Well, preventing sin in your life or overcoming sin in your life. They have no sufficiency, no ability. Or maybe flipping it around to the positive, Paul emphatically affirms that nothing other than the person and work of Christ has any value to overcome sin in our lives. Now he alters his approach in these final verses in the assessment, and he starts with a conditional statement and a rhetorical question. So what he says is this, if you're a believer, and he's assuming that to be true for the sake of the rest of the argument, if you're a believer, and I believe you are, is the implication, then why, the rhetorical question, do you live as if you're subject to the world's value system? by submitting yourself to the various legalistic practices, such as don't handle, nor taste, nor touch. Okay, so he's setting up this contrast. So if you're one of these, why do you behave like one of these? Okay, so that's how he's setting it up. Now then he goes on to answer his very logical rhetorical question himself, with three arguments as to why they are silly. Why would you live like this? Well, it's silly for three reasons. The first one, he says, is that they expire upon use. They have no lasting value. We're going to enjoy a wonderful meal today. It's going to have some value for a period of time as it nourishes our body. But once we're done eating it, it's gone. There's nothing of lasting value. So why do you treat those things like they have this huge value in your life? Secondly, he's going to say that they are based on the wisdom of vain and fallible human beings who, ironically, are also going to expire on use. I hate to inform all of you, but you all came out with an expire on date, right? You know better than the meat that's in the meat market. God's got a date and we're going to expire. That means we're going to leave this world. So why would you base your faith on something that's fallible? Human beings. That's his second pointing out of the folly. And then the third one is, uh, kind of my interpretation, is these things are like whitewashed tombs. They, they look real good on the outside. And they, and they even seem to be nice. So let's say you're house hunting. You see a house, nice, beautiful, whitewashed tomb. You see a house with a beautiful exterior. And you go inside, and what do you find? A bunch of decayed, rotten, dead, smelly bodies, right? So it's just saying simply, they look good, but they're useless. Okay, so three things. Why do you pay attention to them as if they have some kind of lasting value? Why do you submit to fallible human beings and why are, you, why are you deceived by something that looks good on the inside? And it's horrible. I mean, sorry, it looks good on the outside. And it's horrible on the inside. And then he concludes with this simple statement, saying they are of no value against sinful desires. Paul has a definitive finality in this statement. He doesn't equivocate. He doesn't assign any partial value to these practices over against the sufficiency of Christ. Or maybe to do a play on words, he says these spiritual counterfeits have absolutely no redeeming value. The practices themselves are not redeeming, meaning valuable, and they don't redeem, meaning they can't save you. They're of no redeeming value. They're completely worthless. So, a couple implications and then I'll conclude. The first is this. All of these spiritual counterfeits are syncretistic. That word simply means that something working together with something else. They attempt to add something to Christ to either make him more palatable, easier to swallow, or less offensive in his demands, or attempt to elevate man's profile 
and it suggests that we can bring something to God's banquet table when Christ alone is our sufficient feast. So if you remember back to the summer, for those of you who were here, we did a summer learning series, and we looked at this question, what is the gospel? And in the context of doing that, I gave you a formula. And the formula was this. Christ plus or minus anything equals, anybody remember the last part? Nothing. Christ plus anything that's said to be necessary or Christ absent any of the essential elements of the gospel is worth nothing. But Christ himself, Christ alone, Christ in his full supremacy and full sufficiency is all that we need for saving faith. The second implication is this, and that is that all spiritual counterfeits are attempts to dethrone Christ and put ourselves up on the throne. They deny Christ as Lord and Master of our life in favor of coronating ourselves as King. Now, look it. I'm not preaching at you because I do it all the time. I'm preaching to you. We all do it very easily. We somehow think that we have some kind of self-sufficiency, that we have something we're going to bring to the game, and every time we do that, we kind of nudge him a little bit more off his rightful place, which is in the center of our hearts and the throne of our lives. At a minimum, these things are going to weaken our faith and make us vulnerable. Or worse, they misdirect our faith and affections to something that does not save. In fact, we'll do something on this topic next week as we take a quick break for the Lunar New Year Sunday. So as I said just a minute ago, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And he is seeking to devour someone. And he uses these counterfeits to bait his trap. There's nothing really horribly sneaky about Satan. What's sad is just how easily we fall for the bait. But to the contrary, Christ is eternal. He's supreme and he's sufficient. And we do not need to settle for the shadow or fall prey to Satan when we have the original. And that is the substance, which is Christ. We have the original. The best way to not do counterfeits is just to know the original. Know the original so well that the counterfeits are completely obvious. Now, I can't think of any better way to express his matchless worth in closing than the chorus from the song, All I Have is Christ. Now, I wish I could sing it, because I would like to just sing it to you, but I don't have the voice to do it. But instead, I just want you to listen to the words, and then we're going to sing it together to close our service today. The chorus of this song is this, Hallelujah, which is just a transliteration of a Hebrew word which means praise God. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus is my life. And these words, friends, are the words of eternal life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, 